Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our Deep Ecology series, which was begun a few years ago. But today we'll move on to a full book overview of R. Ness's short collection of essays titled There Is No Point of No Return. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. Also, if you find this discussion of deep ecology interesting, you may want to check out my 380 plus page book, The Later Philosophy of Pentelinkula, which was released about two years ago, as well as my upcoming book, Accelerationism and Deep Ecology, which will hopefully be completed sometime within the next year, although I am working on a few other projects at the same time, but at the very least, we should be discussing these issues right now here over YouTube. But before we can get into the details of this short collection of essays entitled there is no point of no return. It is necessary to briefly review some of uh, Arnes's general philosophical ideas, which are not so explicitly contained in this book, on grounds that, it seems to me anyway, there was some sort of understanding on the part of the editors that um, you should have already learned this information somewhere else. Or whatever might be the case, uh, it is necessary now for us to learn this material before actually engaging with the content of the text. The uh, first thing we can say is that Arnes was a Norwegian philosopher who had coined the term deep ecology in 1972 at the Third World Future Research Conference in Romania. The story goes that Ness favored this term deep ecology in order to contrast his own approach with shallow ecology approaches, which would make one of the following few mistakes which we will go over very quickly. The first of these mistakes would be to try to evaluate nature in terms of some other specialized discipline or system of knowledge. You could have an evaluation of nature through the lens of biology, for example, or chemistry or physics, and those are perfectly legitimate um, in their own right, but a deep ecology was trying to do something different. It would try to evaluate nature in a way that does not presuppose any established system of knowledge because it is trying to avoid the error really of evaluating nature in terms of any human interest. For this reason, he also opposed deep ecology to any evaluation of nature which um, uh, does so uh, solely on grounds of its usefulness for humans and the kinds of projects they are work, uh, interested in working on, which these days are, of course, technological pro projects. Now, he does not call this the technological approach to nature so explicitly as I do, but that's really what this is, because we have to bear in mind that if um, humans discover some part of nature to be useful to them, what that really means is that at that very moment it loses its right to be natural because at that moment the technological system comes in and it turns that into so much raw material to be stockpiled and then used by industry ultimately to become an object of human consumption, which virtually always means that it'll be destroyed. So you can see how that's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do with deep ecology, but it's not only this destruction of nature in the overt sense of the term that you have with technology, which um, we have to avoid with deep ecology. It's also, ironically enough, um, the romantic praise of nature, which would seem to be the goal here, which um, he also uh, warns against falling into. Now, the reason for this is that if you have the romantic praise for nature's beauty, this aesthetic approach to nature is still not deep enough to count as deep ecology because, um, let's face it, anybody who does that will pretty much focus exclusively only on those few fragments of nature which happen to look good to that person, which will, of course, be on purely subjective grounds of evaluation. In the process, the same person who will be praising the beauty of nature, at least for the little bit of nature that they happen to notice, um, they'll inevitably disregard all of the rest of nature rather than affirm its intrinsic worth. But of course, with um, deep ecology, we're trying to um, uh, posit the diversity and richness of all of nature as goods in themselves. Now, um, Ar Arnes argues um, that the um, d mode of language, or rather the level of language at which deep ecology operates is, ironically enough, not the deepest, yet this will turn into one of its strengths. And what he means by that is the principles which allow you to meaningfully okay, um, posit the diversity and richness of nature as inherent goods in themselves. Well, the irony is that um, the level at which such principles of deep ecology are located 
um, cannot in fact be the deepest layers of meaning because deep ecology is not trying to do the same thing as say metaphysics which provides an ultimate definition of being qua being and it's also not trying to do the same thing as religion religion also answers those ultimate questions of value and truth and things like that but you may have noticed that um the deep ecology movement is fundamentally compatible with uh, many such viewpoints okay so there are deep ecologists um, from diverse religious uh, backgrounds say buddhist deep ecologists hindu deep ecologists christian deep ecologists maybe secularist or atheist or agnostic they may not have a religion in the traditional sense doesn't matter all of these deep ecologists can still agree with one another on the principles of deep ecology, which we will go over in great detail in this video, even if they will not agree with one another regarding the ultimate questions that I just mentioned. This is also true of philosophy. You could be um, somebody from the um, answer to the question, what is being qua being, that Heidegger gives, and that might be your philosophy, that, that you know, being qua being is Dasein, basically being is time, is kind of the play on words within, or the real meaning of that title, right? Um, and uh, you might come from the Deleuzian perspective also, you know, somebody else might come from the Deleuzian perspective of saying, no, being qua being is difference in itself. Doesn't matter. They can agree on the, the deepest layer of meaning, which tells you about um, basically um, metaphysics and religion. The, the, they tell you about the ultimate values doesn't matter deep ecology is not located there okay and in fact deep ecology presupposes that the person who adopts the deep ecology standpoint has already answered those questions elsewhere but this is actually a good thing for ness because one of the sources of deep ecology's unique ability to allow the world to reach a productive consensus regarding a path for actually moving forward to save nature, um, the, the, the ability which deep ecology has to do that successfully is precisely that it does not ask anyone to compromise the diversity of their viewpoints. Okay, Ness openly and endlessly praises this diversity of backgrounds within the movement itself as a good thing. And he argues that um, harmony and nonviolence, even within the human um, community cannot help but follow from adapting deep ecology because the source of violence and disharmony even amongst humans really does stem from a misunderstanding of this diversity that's a misunderstanding which will inevitably um, disappear not only um, with within our relations with each other but also our relation to nature itself Therefore, we can only understand um, Ness's claim that deep ecology is less deep than religion and metaphysics, and yet, you know, uh, deeper than, like, policy and concrete action, if we keep in mind that, like uh, Aristotle and Bertrand Russell, our Ness really did believe that communication could be facilitated by clarifying the distinctions among certain layers of communication which might otherwise be confused for one another and lead to unnecessary problems as a result. In what he calls level one, you find those deepest, that deepest layer of the ultimate philosophies. You Here you have religions like, say, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism. You have uh, metaphysics. You have the answer of what is being qua being as provided by Aristotle or Heidegger or Deleuze fill in the blank. Okay, and that's find the deep ecology principles are located in level two okay um, which is distinct from that entirely and this is where you also find the principles of other movements that he considers to be fundamentally i guess related to deep ecology he argues that you also find the principles of the peace movement here if you, if you um adopt the standpoint of deep ecology you uh, naturally become a, a pacifist also says ness okay and um you also find here the uh principles of the social justice movement if you become a deep ecologist you'll also naturally be opposed to things um, like poverty okay you'll be trying to eliminate poverty within the world and bring about social justice um, at least in the uh, you know the, the meaningful sense of that term rather than uh, what it has unfortunately come to stand for all too often but um, the idea for Arnes is that um, the uh, principles that you find in level two um, do not provide uh, answers for ultimate questions of meaning or being, but they also do not provide concrete proposals for action. Those are located in shallower levels. You have to move from there to uh, level three, where you actually find the policies, okay? And um, these are, once again, compatible 
with a number of different uh, perspectives from those deeper layers because it's in level three. And then finally in uh, level four, you find practical actions as such, okay? So this is a very credible proposal for how you could have um, a certain unification of the world for an effort which, let's just face it, would be uh, trying to accomplish like the, the single biggest thing in history, which would be saving the planet from the current level of technological interference, which is historically unprecedented. Well, um, Ness shows that that's something which could be accomplished without sacrificing the diversity of viewpoints and backgrounds which people bring, okay? And with this background information out of the way, we can now begin examining this uh, short collection of essays in greater detail. The first essay is titled The Deep Ecology Movement, in which Ness mentions from the start that um, trying to provide an answer to the very legitimate question, what is deep ecology? Um, is, is something that um, you know we should try to provide that answer, but he warns in advance that um, we would uh, be misled to try to uh, respond to that by giving a definition. Because if we give a definition of a movement, that would imply on a logical level that all of the adherents of that movement would follow it in more or less the same way. This is, however, particularly inappropriate in the case of the deep ecology movement, for the whole point of this movement is to value diversity as an inherent good in itself. This is a diversity which we celebrate as much in the personal backgrounds of the human members of the movement we're trying to have cover the whole world, right, um, or unify the whole world. Um, we, we celebrate that diversity there just as much as we do in the natural ecosystems which we're trying to protect. Likewise, Ness does not try to provide an ultimate definition of deep ecology, but instead provides a set of principles which, once again, differ fundamentally from the kind of statements regarding um, uh, you know, uh, being or religion or things like that that you find in the deepest level, but they're also not concrete um, uh, actions that you find um, or proposals for action that you find in the shallowest level, okay? So this distinction between a deepest level of ultimate values and this second deepest level of principles is exactly what allows Ness to celebrate um, deep ecology as perhaps uniquely conducive to the Habermasian ideal of um, a community in which consensus will um, naturally emerge from the participation of so many rational speakers. We keep in mind that for Habermas, um, consensus is something which cannot simply be an idea which any one person had already held before the discussion began. If you're trying to have that same idea win the argument, you're not really communicating, okay? You're not letting the discussion lead to a consensus that is validated objectively by science and, um, and is uh, as reached without any um, um, manipulation of the other members who also productively lead that direction. No, at that point, you're simply coercing rather than communicating, says Habermas. Well, although Ness doesn't really talk about Habermas, he, he seems to agree that out of all the movements, uh, deep ecology should be uniquely um, suited for actually providing us the community where something like that can happen, okay? And he um, holds this view of deep ecology because um, the principles are the following eight, which we will briefly examine before considering in much greater detail as he himself does within this essay. Now, the first of these principles is that the flourishing of life is a good in itself, regardless of whether the life in question is human or non-human. Likewise, this flourishing of life, which extends to things like plants and animals and fungi and so many other things, um, which might not ord ordinarily hold your attention, okay? Now, this flourishing of life cannot be subordinated to any human-centric value judgments regarding whether it is useful, convenient, or even aesthetically ple pleasing to humans. The danger, we've been told um, by you know ecologists, is that there are certain animals which are easy to gain sympathy because they're very noticeable um, and large, especially, you know, we, ha we can feel very passionate about saving um, rhinoceroses or elephants, but there's many much smaller, more obscure, perhaps less noticeable animals which are also worthy of our attention. Now, that's exactly what deep ecology is trying to get us to, um, to formulate a, a way to actually respond to that challenge. Now, the second principle is that the richness and diversity of life forms are values in themselves. The third is that humans have no right to reduce that richness and diversity of life except to satisfy vital survival needs. 
The fourth is that human overpopulation, and these goals are inversely related to one another. As human overpopulation increases, the very possibility of preserving the richness and diversity of all life forms necessarily decreases, eventually reaching the point of uh, becoming almost impossible. It goes without saying, then, as he mentions in the fifth principle, that our current level of interference is excessive, not only due to overpopulation, but also due to the sheer amount of um, technological intervention which goes to satisfy desires rather than needs, um, and desires really which are only ever artificially invented by corporate marketers, and they do this in order to sell things to people that they didn't know that they wanted until the advertisers on TV told them that they were supposed to. This is a completely unnecessary and I would argue avoidable state of affairs which um, we could find some way to overcome if we realize the seriousness of the situation and if we adopt the right, I guess, uh, communicative um, uh, framework to do so. Okay, now the sixth um, principle is that it necessarily follows that a major change must occur. But this must affect the underlying economic, technological, and ideological structures rather than remain at that superficial level of politics. This is basically the same point which um, Ted Kaczynski opened the uh, Unabomber Manifesto with. He said that we, we're talking about a revolution, but this is not a political revolution, if by that you mean changing the president or the, the party that controls Congress. I mean, the last couple of elections, they said this is the most important in your life. Well, no matter who won, you might have noticed that the, the one thing that never changed was the technological basis of society which found a way to continue advancing at a, a frightening pace, um, regardless of which party seemed to be in charge. Um, as a result, um, Ness claims any social order that actually did follow from such a change to that deeper level of society um, will be radically different from the current one in the sense of having foundations um, that lead to a way of life that very well might seem unimaginable by today's standards. Well, even if it is unimaginable, um, it's still something which we should have confidence is realistic and something which we can find a way to bring about. Okay. Now, in the seventh principle, he notes that insofar as an ideological change is entailed by deep ecology, it is largely a shift from quantitative measurements to qualitative appreciation. So what this means more concretely is um, the only question which seems to be meaningful um, in economic terms, for example, is the quantitative measurement of a standard of living. Okay, Because you can put that in terms that um, even um, <laughs> people as uh, unreliable as uh, economists can understand, even if they use those numbers to make very inaccurate predictions. But be that as it may, they can understand numbers. But if you're talking about um, uh, the qualitative appreciation of um, one's uh, life at, uh, in a sense that um, cannot be reduced to standard of living, well, economists would dismiss that as a, a question that is too ambiguous to even, to even make sense. We don't even know what you're talking about if you can't quantify it. This is something which we have to overcome, okay, insofar as the quality of life, not only for humans, but for all of the living things on the earth is something that can only come about through, ironically enough, accepting what economists would erroneously call a lower standard of living. Okay, The eighth principle is that it is not enough to think about these principles in the abstract. For anyone who really understands this will necessarily make major changes in his or her own lifestyle and above all to their consumption habits. Deep ecology will lead one to adopt a standpoint of constantly questioning rather than thinking that one already has all of the answers. And that is exactly the kind of mentality which we have to have at this point of history. So with the list completed of, you know, short answers with regard to uh, what the principles are, Ness now goes on to provide much more information about each one of these principles. He notes that with regard to the first principle, um, because life in this context refers to so much more than only human life. This statement really refers to the whole biosphere slash ecosphere, but if that is the case, it is um, something of an ethical imperative to humans to allow uh, not just life forms to not be overtly or obviously killed. For example, you, you oppose things like poaching, you know, the kind of overfishing which uh, John Michael Greer claims um, will guarantee that at some point in your life um, you will have the last piece of uh, seafood that you will ever taste. That's how um, 
dangerous the uh, practices of industrial overfishing uh, have already been for years. Um, but it's not just those um, easily identifiable acts of violence against animals that should uh, um, worry us at this moment. It's rather the disruption on a much more subtle level of the processes which um, contribute to the richness and diversity of life within nature. The disruption of those processes is perhaps even more important than an overtly obvious act of, say, one guy poaching an endangered animal in the woods. Okay, that's also terrible. But the disruption of those natural cycles is actually capable of far uh, greater scale uh, damage, okay? And you must bear in mind that, as John Michael Greer noted himself, insofar as you could attribute a memological shape to nature, insofar as you could say that nature thinks or works in terms of some geometrical symbol, um, it's really the circle. John Michael Greer noted that um, the repeating natural cycles, such as the one that replenishes depleted water in southern India here, that would be through the monsoon, or in uh, where I'm from in North America, that would be like the heavy snowfall in the Rocky Mountains that later provides the, the water for the farms lying downhill from there. If you disrupt those cycles, okay, under the illusion of thinking through the kind of straight lines that modern technology favors, you will have perhaps short-term success through doing things like depleting non-renewable aquifers in areas with very little uh, rainfall. You can do that in the short term. Okay, but the very survival of humans depends upon these cycles, like the one that replenishes that water, which um, are provided by nature itself in a way that um, technology really cannot replicate. Okay, if that is the case, though, even things considered to be non living, such as rivers, come to be included within the sphere of life and therefore demand a deep respect which cannot be subordinated to any human-centric presuppositions regarding utility or even aesthetic beauty. In the second principle, he explains it further by noting that richness and diversity are values in themselves. That is to say, um, they're values that retain their value even in the hypothetical absence of any human standards of judgment, and perhaps even in the absence of any humans. What this really means is that the conditions which are naturally conducive to bringing about richness and diversity are also goods in themselves. In nature, these conditions which enable diversity and richness are called complexity and symbiosis. Okay. But um, these are easily obscured by the anthropocentric myth that evolutionary processes are teleologically oriented towards devaluing the quote-unquote simpler life forms by replacing them with more advanced ones. The myth goes that humans lie, of course, at the very end of that supposed evolutionary process. Well, this idea that humans are more evolved than any other life forms misses the point that all of them are equally evolved. Humans did not replace, say, algae, because they occupy different ecological niches. So any talk of us replacing um, or devaluing quote-unquote simpler life forms is uh, completely nonsensical. Also, insofar as uh, evolutionary processes unfold within nature over time, the result of that is naturally an increase in diversity rather than a narrowing down to one uniquely privileged life form as the end goal. Anyone who claims that the end result of natural evolution is supposed to be a technological world populated only by humans and whatever domesticated animals they uh, keep largely in a torturing, uh, horrific conditions um, in order to have them as food sources. Well, anyone who claims that that's where evolution is naturally teleologically oriented towards leading us, well, they have no understanding of ecology, let alone uh, and any understanding of deep ecology. It also bears mentioning that the kind of complexity which you find in nature cannot be confused with the kind of complication which is found in human-produced technologies. Great example of this is that just as uh, technology artificially creates massively complicated urban areas, these cities actually entail a shocking loss of the kind of complexity which nature alone can provide. What they really do is just carve out so many dead zones, which are mostly inhabited by humans and a few parasitic species like rats cockroaches, uh, in India it's largely crows and street dogs, 
that are only there and the kind of numbers you see because they're feeding on human produced food waste. Finnish deep ecologist Penti Linkola once warned that rat overpopulation really is human overpopulation in disguise because the only condition which allows uh, New York City, for example, to have more rats than people in already the most overpopulated city in America, well, um, the only thing that allows that kind of rat overpopulation is the sheer amount of trash which these same people carelessly produce. This leads some 40% of all the food in the USA to end up in the trash can, just as many people are too poor to afford food, um, but the, um, the uh, Food ending up in the trash can is not their final destination. Really, it ultimately ends up inside the gut of some rat. So, principle three notes um, in as in greater detail, I should say that um, the only interventions allowed are the ones that satisfy vital needs. But that naturally begs the question: which needs are vital? Well. Arnest responds to that by noting that um, you can't really answer that without taking into consideration the unique conditions of each particular social context in which people live. What is vital for an Inuit living in the Arctic, for example, will not be the same as what is vital for someone living in a tropical area like here in Kerala in southern India where I live. This intentional ambiguity with regard to the question of vital needs is, of course, meant to advance the diversity of human viewpoints around the world as a good in itself. So the ambiguity is not a technical problem in need of a solution, for it's exactly what allows the deep ecology to move forward a dialogue that should take us from those underlying principles to much more concrete policies and then finally to actions which are actually executed in the real world. If we consider the fourth principle in greater detail, I find that Ness admits that the so-called first world nations have already deviated so far away from the natural norms that dropping these habits overnight is not even a realistic option. While it is a given that you have to propose some interim strategies on the way to the end goal, this should not, however, be misconstrued as an excuse to fall into the kind of willful inaction masquerading as a powerlessness so rampant even among those who profess themselves to be environmentalists, especially within the West. There is also an inverse relation in which the longer we defer the change, the bigger the change itself will have to be because the damage which it seeks to correct will inevitably be even greater. In the meantime, more diversity and richness of life within nature will inevitably be lost as the technological system grows in size and strength. This is something you should keep in mind while considering the timing for when such changes should be pursued. In the fifth principle, we find that it is also debatable how much interference is quote-unquote acceptable if we take as a given that no interference whatsoever is, let's just face it, an impossible goal. This is something which John Michael Greer also uh, noted in an early Archdrude report post that um, even the hunter-gatherers which anarcho-primitivists like John Zerzan uh, posit as the ideal humans, they're basically on ecological grounds the most ethical humans to have ever existed, well even they still have to exploit resources within their environment in order to stay alive. They have to, for example, stay fed, which means they hunt and they gather. They also have to produce very simple tools. They have to produce heat through, uh, say, burning firewood and things like that. Now, obviously, um, the amount of, I don't know, exploitation going on there is negligible by modern standards, but let's just face it, there will always be some level of that where humans exist. Um, Ness noted that one thing which can be kept in mind is that any hope for the natural processes leading to the speciation of plants and animals to continue will require wild spaces to um, not only be allowed to exist, but to um, span a minimal amount of space which would seem by current standards to be extremely large. He warns us that maintaining wild spaces of only a very small size really won't do anything except perhaps serve humans' vanity by providing them with parks, which can only be admired for their recreational and aesthetic uh, value. In the sixth principle, uh, he notes that insofar as any attempt is made today to revise the economic paradigm for the sake of environmentalist concerns, it never really goes far enough because virtually all attempts which are made to formulate sustainability policies presuppose that one is speaking 
of what is sustainable for humans and never asks what might be sustainable for all life forms. At this point, Ness warns that the solution must be global and must cross national boundaries rather than be left up to each country to try to accomplish on its own, in which case the good done by one nation will obviously be undone by another or probably more realistically a lot of other countries. This global cooperation is necessary, Ness tells us, because the problem is global in scope but also because developing nations have a perverse incentive to make the problem worse by caving into pressures even from their own populations to quote unquote develop or to quote unquote raise their standard of living. But this is something which um, can only be done through pushing the um, technological intervention even further than it already is. We can't say that this is a, um, an acceptable uh, thing to do simply because the first world standard of living is something which pretty much everybody on the earth is deserving of having because insofar as you spread access to that first world standard of living, you are um, inherently negating any uh, hope to preserve the richness and diversity of natural life. Therefore, what seems to be good is actually, in reality, quite evil. What seems to be a humanitarian um, act, a moral act is really an eco-crime in disguise. In the seventh principle, he notes that insofar as economists dismiss the phrase quality of life as too vague to actually lead to any concrete policies or actions, what these economists really mean is that quality of life cannot be quantified, at least not in the same way that standard of living can. This is, however, not a flaw. This is exactly the point which Ness is trying to emphasize here, for we have known, at least as far back as ancient Greek philosophy, that quality and quantity are two different categories of meaning. Both of them are perfectly legitimate, but neither of them can be substituted for the other. Deep ecology, therefore, simply asks us to shift our thought process from one category of meaning to another, rather than fall for the error of thinking that only one of these really exists or really is meaningful. In the eighth principle, Ness notes that this emphasis on action over speculation is uh, part of the deep ecology movement as a movement <laughs> rather than a philosophy. In other words, um, philosophies um, are doing something inherently different from the deep ecology movement uh, because philosophies tend to be inherently anthropocentric in the way that they try to provide those ultimate uh, answers to questions like truth and meaning and value, and that's perfectly legitimate. But uh, the point of having deep ecology be called deep is to emphasize that it is situated in a decidedly non-anthropocentric standpoint. In a subsection following after this discussion of the eight principles titled a Deep versus Shallow Ecology, Ness perhaps surprises the reader by choosing not to provide any definitions of these two terms, uh, which would allow the reader to grasp on a theoretical level what the essence of each is in the absence of any more concrete examples. Rather, he simply shows in practice how deep and shallow approaches to very serious real-world problems, he shows how they would differ from one another. For example, whereas shallow ecology would respond to the problem of pollution by seeking to minimize its undesirable effects on humans by passing laws restricting the, pra uh, the practice in areas of human habitation, the deep ecology approach would seek to prevent its negative effects on non-human life forms and the ecosystems as well as natural pr processes which they depend upon for survival. Controversial as it might be, Whereas the shallow approach would also lay responsibility for environmental solutions pretty much solely on the developed world on grounds that it can afford to combat the problem more than the so-called third world can, the deep ecologist would acknowledge shared responsibility among all nations without falling back on any Marxist cliches of placing the blame solely on the owners of the means of production while excusing the working proletariat on grounds that their ideology is determined for them by material conditions lying beyond their control. Deep ecology, in contrast, requires action from all humans, 
rather than defer the power of agency onto this mysterious dialectical historical process alone. Ness provides another example of how shallow and deep ecology would differ from another, one another in practice by uh, considering the problem of how each would deal with resources. The shallow approach assures us that the destruction of animal and plant life forms, as well as their habitats, is not really an ethical problem because these are nothing except resources and are ultimately destined to be used up to meet human needs and desires. Under this view, such resources are also not in danger of ever running out because the so-called laws of economics assure us that a lower supply of these resources will drive up the price, creating a purely financial incentive for technological progress to take over and discover new substitutes which would promise an even higher standard of living due to the myth that anything new is automatically better than what it replaced. You can hear this nonsense, by the way, right now um, from like TYT commenting on the possibility of Russia shutting down um, uh, the uh, the gas uh, trade with with Europe okay and they say well even if that happens it's actually a blessing in disguise because this will be the kick in the pants to finally get Europe to transition to a 100% clean energy economy though of course if that were actually possible it would have happened decades ago, but this is the kind of delusion, I think, fueled solely by modern technology, which uh, the deep ecology uh, perspective should systematically uh, shut down within your mind. You should systematically unlearn such nonsense as that. Now, deep ecology approach calls into question the very idea of using the term resources to describe plant and animal life forms, because these are to be valued as good in themselves rather than as at best useful materials which can be repurposed by technology into objects of human consumption. This is especially true when these natural life forms are destroyed to feed an industry that pumps out disposable junk which serves openly unnecessarily, uh, unnecessary or frivolous consumption habits. It is not enough, however, to be concerned for those specific isolated life forms which, for example, are um, easily identified as being killed by poachers within the woods or something like that, as I mentioned earlier. Rather, you have to show that level of concern for the entire ecosystems of which they are part and upon which they d depend for survival. Similarly, even those who are concerned about overpopulation never bother to ask what the ideal population of non-human life forms might be, even if they do attempt to provide some kind of an answer for what the ideal human population should be. Insofar as shallow ecology seeks to raise the standard of living of developing nations, what this really means is that a few Western corporations will be given the power to replace their age-old cultural traditions with a technologized pseudo-culture imported from the West and sold as a commodity for ever higher prices. The deep ecologist, in contrast, recognizes the inherent value of cultural diversity just as much as it recognizes the value of natural diversity. It also realizes that cultural diversity can only be protected through limiting the interference of modern technology and corporate financial interests in um, the uh, reaches of the earth where it has still not reached the same level of domination as, say, within the United States. Anyone who objects that this simply cannot be done should recall that modern technology is overwhelmingly used to satisfy non-vital desires, which are artificially created by professional marketers who abuse their knowledge of human psychology to induce people to act against their own interests, and they do this through Pavlovian stimulation, rather than anything like genuine hermeneutical interpretation or Habermasian communication. We now move on to uh, another essay within this book called Industrial Society, Postmodernity, and Ecological Sustainability, in which Ness notes that human beings naturally survey their surroundings and sort the contents they find there into subsets of things valued and then things viewed simply with indifference. Unfortunately, right now, saving nature falls into, at best, the category of indifference for the vast majority of human beings, despite the fact that our own long-term survival depends upon the survival of that same nature which seems so unimportant. Instead of realizing this, 
developing nations seem willing to do quite literally anything just to raise their standard of living, despite the fact that Western nations have already proven that this rise in standard of living paradoxically leads to higher crime rates, perhaps due to the loss of meaning or the breakdown of traditional community structures, or maybe just the psychological stress of the high costs and the unemployment stemming from automation, which unfortunately had been uh, posited as you know, goods in themselves when they were sold to you as technological innovation. It was interesting that one American uh, vlogger traveled to the slums of Mumbai, India, and asked the people there about the crime rate. He was incredibly surprised to hear that crime really wasn't an issue, even though the community uh, was far poorer than the kinds of, I don't know, quote-unquote, bad neighborhoods he was used to in the United States. He just had this assumption that if an area is quote-unquote poor, there must be out-of-control crime. He didn't realize that that crime was more the result of the same technological progress which his nation had um, uh, pursued than it was the result of anything like poverty in the very narrowly defined sense of the term that he was bringing to, from his own country to this one. At any rate, Ness notes that this inability to cooperate, to save nature, cannot be blamed on necessity or inevitability, for history has already shown us that the European nations somehow did find a way to cooperate, mobilize, and make sacrifices during the two world wars, but they find it impossible to do the same thing now, despite the fact that the threat of ecological crisis is far greater than any threat which those wars posed, as terrible as they were. The irony is that um, the total cost to our lifestyles um, will also, or rather to our happiness, will actually be much less to save nature than it was even for the war efforts. But this is something which somehow still goes unnoticed. This is because much of the damage of ecological crisis does not actually go to serving vital survival needs. It rather feeds industries which once again sell you stupid junk that you didn't really know that you wanted until the advertisers on TV told you you were supposed to. And even if you give into the black magic and spend money you don't have to get them, they somehow never really make you happy. Arnes notes that the root of the problem is actually the loss of any sense of the sacred. This is something which might surprise you because you would usually think that talk of the sacred only applies to religion, which seems to be concerned with another world. For Nietzsche, that's nihilism because that's concerned with another world beyond this one heaven, which is the perfect world, and, and it flees from this world of nature. Well, Arnes notes that it's really not the case that um, uh, the sacred uh, is inherently concerned with another world. For um, the end result of this loss of the very possibility of a category of the sacred is, is simply that ecological destruction follows immediately afterwards. This is something which Julius Evola also noted in his Revolt Against the Modern World in that in the world of tradition, nature was never exploited in the same way that we take for granted today. That was because it was still possible for something like place, in the genuine sense of the term, to exist. And that was because it could exist on a qualitative level. Whereas in modernity, all places get sucked up into an artificial pseudo space, which is evaluated on a purely quantitative level, and inevitably leads a formerly sacred places to be used up as so much raw material for industry. Similarly, in Julius Evola's book on the Hermetic tradition, he noted that the human experience of nature is fundamental in alchemy too, for whereas in modernity we misunderstand nature to be nothing more than an object of mathematical formalization, in which case it is decomposed into those uh, primitive raw forces of heat, electricity, light, etc., in the world of tradition, Evola tells us nature was always understood to be a living sacred body which would be directly experienced in mysteries rather than artificially reconstructed with abstract scientific models or numerical symbols. In much the same way, Ness um, argues that um, deep ecology is basically traditionalist and traditionalism is basically deep ecology. What he means by this, although he does not use those words himself, 
is that the reason why the world of tradition, or rather the pre-modern world, allowed nature to be experienced as sacred was precisely that it did not personify nature. Now, that might sound strange to someone influenced by the Romantic movement, in which the full appreciation of nature precisely arises from the artist's ability to project his own power of subjectivity onto it, and then, you know, create great art as a result. But Arnes warns that the very notion of a poetic personification of nature really is just another way of talking about the projection of our own subjective emotions onto an inkblot in the outer world, which will always hold an arbitrary and ad hoc relation to the emotion which just happens to be projected onto it. This projection, which lacks any deeper foundation than the whims of the human artist, is not enough to prevent the destruction of nature because it still presupposes that even that beloved inkblot, inkblot is in itself only so much unliving raw material which can be repurposed by technology for industrial purposes just as easily as it was repurposed by the human artist into a temporary placeholder for his own private sentiments. The properly ethical stance towards nature, then, can only follow from seeing it as a living and spiritual being, much like any one of us humans. It bears mentioning that if we don't do that, humans will inevitably turn into raw material for industrial purposes and consumption themselves. For this depersonification of nature ironically leads one to prevent the depersonification of our fellow humans. In addition to calling out poetic personification for what it really is, Ness warns that spontaneous experiences of nature's richness, intensity, and depth are also to be contrasted with the kind of abstract structures which are favored by scientific explanation. This is the real reason why deep ecology simply cannot be subordinated to any other scientific discipline or system of knowledge, something which sounded like a very controversial claim the first time you heard it now really does make sense, as Ness acknowledges that even if one can say that nature has certain structures which, say, physics or some other science attributes to them, nature itself doesn't ever directly reveal such structures. These structures, which physics, etc., gives us, can only ever be artificially reconstructed with the powers of human thinking, or in uh, Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology terms, they can only ever be reconstructed through human overmining, which um, transforms the interpretation of the object into the form which gets the cl as close as possible to the uh, uh, structures of human thinking, such as uh, num numbers and things like that. Harmon noted that this overmining has somehow led string theory itself to branch off into thousands of different string theories in the plural. All of them are equally mathematically correct, but we know that only one of them can really be true. This is the kind of um, retreat into abstraction which is fundamentally at odds with the kind of things which the deep ecologist is trying to accomplish, in contrast with this symbolic overmining valued by the shallow ecologist, the deep ecologist realizes that what is revealed directly by nature are not anything like that. What is revealed directly by nature is just all of those wonderfully real smells and sounds and tastes and sights of something which must be living rather than simply an object of human thought. Ness affirms that we should not escape this for some truer explanation, for the goal is rather to grow to love this whole as something which we ourselves are a part of. Finally, Ness warns that there is something distinctly Western about the kinds of structures of abstract explanation offered by the overmining of the shallow ecologist, but this overemphasis on the kind of science done and developed by industrial Western civilization inherently negates deep ecology's call towards diversity and universal compatibility, even on a purely human level. In an essay called Self-Realization, an Ecological Approach to Being in the World, Ness returns to the 
uh, question of whether deep ecology is a philosophy. You might recall in the first essay, he noted that it's more fitting to call deep ecology a movement rather than a philosophy, because once again, we're not giving you the metaphysical definition of being the ultimate understanding of truths and values and things like that. But in this essay, he interestingly claims that the same questions which have gone largely unsatisfactorily uh, result, are, are, are unsatisfactorily dealt with for the past 2,500 years within Western philosophy actually can be best answered by deep ecology. Or maybe it would be closer to the truth to say that these questions of traditional philosophy can be asked in a better way by the deep ecologists than they would by the kinds of Western philosophical um, thinkers that you find from Socrates onward. One example of such a question is who are we? Another is, what is the nature of reality? Well, both of these can be formulated much better by the deep ecologist because, uh, for one, deep ecology allows us to see that we underestimate ourselves in the literal sense of mistaking the narrowly defined ego of, say, Descartes for the true selves, which we really are. The deep ecologist realizes that because we are inherently ecological beings, we always extend far beyond the kind of narrow limits which uh, Descartes and his followers had set for the human mind by defining it as the thinking thing, or res cachitans, which cannot be directly identified even with its own body. The body becomes the unthinking thing, or the merely extended res extensa. The deep ecologist realizes that human nature properly understood cannot help but identify with all things rather than even the narrowly defined anthropocentric chimera of mankind. Now, Ness explains this very controversial thesis by recalling um, our attention to the theory of socialization as explained by psychologists. In psychology, socialization refers to the process uh, by which the narrowly defined ego, which is admittedly capable of things like individual thoughts, comes to mature into a social self-consciousness, which has interiorized the cultural norms of its community, despite the fact that those are arbitrary. After interiorizing them, it is not only capable of understanding them in the abstract, but is also capable of performing these norms concretely through the right kinds of behaviors that would be appropriate for the given context in which that person lives. The socialized child then comes to be accepted by his or her peers because they recognize that they are all basically the same person in the sense that they've all learned how to act the way that Dasman acts as Heidegger would put it, or just uh, it, within modern American English, they know how one acts in such a situation. Well, Ness accepts this idea of a socialization, but faults it for considering only one's integration into a social context inhabited by other homo sapiens. Ness argues that the ecological self extends this context much further to include all living things, as well as non-living natural processes and habitats as we noted earlier. Well, with this idea established, Ness moves on to clarify that the stereotypical big philosophical question over something as uh, important as the meaning of life itself, well, that's really a question asking what brings happiness. Ness accepts that the answer for what brings happiness is uh, something like one's ability to realize one's inner potentiality. But he sees this as something which only really happens if one goes beyond the narrowly defined ego, not only in a broader social context in which one learns how to identify oneself in other humans in one's community, but even further than that, he speaks of an ecological context in which one learns to identify oneself in nature itself. The self is paradoxically only ever fulfilled if it is widened to include the whole ecosystem rather than stay limited to trying to actualize its own inherent powers as something like an isolated self-enclosed agent which really doesn't exist. What must be realized, he says, is the potential not just of me but all of nature. And only this realization of nature will bring happiness for each one of us. It logically follows, then, that continued disruptions of ecological norms through historically unprecedented technological interferences 
inherently decreases the ability to enjoy the happiness of self-realization, not only for humans, but for all living things. This should make sense when one considers that the condition for happiness cannot be limited to any one entity, but rather presupposes a broader ecosystem which is necessarily harmed by all further technological disruptions of nature. The stereotypical idea that the destruction of nature is a necessary trade-off required to satisfy the conditions for human happiness, which of course in this context is a, meant in a purely consumeristic sense, well, that stereotype misses the point that happiness and the destruction of nature are two mutually exclusive options. If you have one, you, uh, by definition, if you have the destruction of nature, you do not have happiness. In other words, our happiness can only come to fruition um, if you have the preservation of nature itself, which is a fact that was arguably confirmed by the tendency for the most technologically progressive communities in the USA to also have the highest rates of antidepressant use even back in the 1990s before that practice had gone more mainstream. Well, such claims only seem to be paradoxical if one presupposes that the self is more or less identical with the one object which one um, knows as one's body. Well, if that were the case, Ness tells us, one would be able to substitute the term my body for the term I without changing the meaning of the following sentences. But we know that the sentence I know Mrs. Smith and the sentence my body knows Mrs. Smith don't actually mean the same thing. And even more so, the sentence, the only difference between us is that you are a Baptist and I am a Presbyterian, um, cannot be translated into the sentence, the only difference between our bodies is that your body is a Baptist and my body is a Presbyterian. The only solution, Ness tells us, is to realize that the object of personal identification is not one's own isolated physical body but instead a self which is inherently ecological rather than Cartesian. That is a very mysterious claim, admittedly, which will make a good deal more sense if we think of identification as something that is inherently a process rather than think of um, the, the self as something like a thing, okay? So the um, mystery of why you would want to save an animal that is dying, um, why would you want to save it from danger, um, really, I think, can only be answered if you find that um, the kind of empathy which you extend even to a non-human animal is itself an instance of you seeing yourself in that animal. At the moment that you see yourself in that other, you will be willing to do anything because you're actually just trying to save yourself. How much more so would be this be the case if one realizes the ethical call at the moment to try to save nature as a whole on a global level rather than one unfortunate animal? Even the environmentalist cliche, therefore, which describes natural conservation efforts by human as a quote-unquote necessary acts of unselfishness, miss the point by presupposing that humans are self-enclosed objects which are separate from the nature which they must be asked to sacrifice their own luxuries for the sake of saving. Saving nature, Ness tells us, is quite literally saving oneself. There is no real distinction between the two. This is because... Um, there is no separation between the self and the place which it inhabits, for we have seen that abruptly relocating people from more natural conditions to urbanized ones does not keep their understanding of themselves intact, but oftentimes leads to uh, very devastating uh, conclusions. On a practical level, this reveals any claim by opponents that the only reason any person might choose to preserve nature is just the uh, pathological goal of using it for their own recreational or aesthetic enjoyment. Well, this claim misses the point that one can only use nature for such purposes if one already feels alienated from the broader natural context. But this is a disruption of the norm one had had of feeling to be a part of it from the moment, from the, the time of one's infancy. In this sense, deep ecology really is a reversion to this earlier state. It's a systematic unlearning of all of those uh, uh, thought errors that led you into the cave of Cartesianism. At this point, Ness recalls Immanuel Kant's crucial distinction between the moral act and the beautiful act. The moral act, we recall, obeys the universal moral law, but does so only um, um, because it has to and will uh, do so even if it not only gets no enjoyment from it, but even if it actively hates 
having to follow it. In contrast, Ness tells us that um, in following the law because one actually wants to do it, you have the beautiful act, as Kant calls it. This is much like the beautiful soul that we find near the very end of Hegel's Phenomenology, as the one who has interiorized the universal moral law, even to the point uh, that one's act holds the universality of morality despite really being one's own individual free choice in a true reconciliation of seeming opposites. This then faults the environmentalist movement for framing their arguments in the purely negative terms of asking the public to sacrifice their happiness for the sake of some endangered species which the public may often find to be simply unworthy of their concern. This is a very bad and misplaced approach, for we should instead be enlightening the public to realize that their own happiness can only come about through realizing the potential of a self which is ecological and therefore extends as far as the same natural ecosystems which they will actively enjoy protecting once they make such an adjustment of perspective. What does it mean to enjoy performing an ecologically ethical act, though? Well, Ness argues that statements featuring the word happy actually can retain their meaning even if the word self-realized is substituted for the word happy. This is because happiness is just another word for self-realization rather than a feeling of mere pleasure or contentment as we normally think. To say, I feel self-realized while acting ethically for the environment, therefore means exactly that myself is this broader ecological self, which is directly benefited by these same acts of natural preservation. Not coincidentally, the term self-realization is also more widely applicable than the term happy because all living things can experience it, while happiness in the usual sense of the term pretty much only refers to a specifically human psychological state. Uh, Ness humorously references the example of the praying mantis to explain this. The male praying mantis must mate to be fully self-realized, but as you may know, while doing so, he is sometimes eaten up by the female. Although the term happiness is not expansive enough to describe the male praying mantis's state at that moment, the term self-realization actually is. In the essay, The Place of Joy in a World of Fact, Ness asks once again, is joylessness really a requirement to do the right thing for the environment? Well, unfortunately, the public is all too familiar with the stereotypical image of the environmentalist as someone who is either asking the public to make sacrifices, which uh, he or she has no interest in making him or herself, um, or portraying such sacrifices as a necessary loss of happiness for a higher cause, which calls to mind Freudian ideals of repression, which have trouble finding many enthusiastic supporters. Well, one misunderstanding at work here really goes back to existentialism of all things. It's true that dread in existentialism is what opens one up to a deeper understanding of life, but such dread is not simply the opposite of joy. Rather, Ness tells us that dread is internally related to joy. He explains this by knowing that um, even if one were to respond to something as serious as the coming environmental catastrophe simply by feeling sad, one would miss the point that that kind of sadness is regret, but that kind of regret is a sign of immaturity because it misses the point that the solution is not to feel remorse for what was done in the past, but rather to actively do something different in the future, and um, even more important than that, to do something in the present. Another misconception is that you can only have joy if you get away from misery, but that's not true. Um, doing humanitarian work for the suffering, in which case you're literally getting as close to misery as possible, that's something which also should be done with joy. But what on earth is the kind of um, evil we're trying to avoid, really? He notes that Spinoza and Thomas Aquinas defined evil as an inherently misleading term because it would seem to refer to a thing, but it's really not a thing at all. It's just a privation, and specifically privation of the good. Blindness is like that too. It seems to be a positive thing, but it's really just the privation of sight. Well, for Spinoza, the joy of the whole body, as opposed to the kinds of joys which are not quite as expansive as that, in other words, the most expansive joy is the joy of the whole body for Spinoza, um, this is the joy also of the whole system, or we could say um, the, the, the whole substance, or we could say all of nature. 
because of Spinoza's idea that there's only one substance. Well, in deep ecology also, we find that the joy of the whole body is the joy of all of nature, because insofar as we try to integrate this into um, the, integrate this in practice, we find that joy simply is the transition from lesser to greater perfection, as Spinoza tells us, but Ness clarifies that greater perfection in this context is just another word for greater wholeness. Well, if the privation of this kind of joy is evil, then um, traditional calls to just suck it up and do one's ethical duty for the sake of nature without any joy reveal an inherent contradiction. Such a lack of joy, as they describe, cannot be good, for it is itself simply the evil. What is required by deep ecology is a thinking in terms of the total biosphere, which is exactly the tendency towards completeness, which is inherently joyful for the same reasons that Spinoza had already documented centuries ago. We therefore cannot fall back on the narrower perspective of any one particular scientific discipline to restore that whole, which is um, um, integral to any experience of joy, because the tendency towards mathematical formalization will only lead its presentation of nature to fall into um, a, a smaller piece of abstract mathematical reality rather than to realize the joy of that whole. It bears mentioning that the mathematical reality, which it gives us a tiny piece of, is actually not the world that we live in, for our living environment is once again made up of all of those wonderful colors, smells, odors, beautiful and ugly details, such that it would be sheer folly to look for an existing thing that did not have these qualities. In that sort of truly sensed world, he tells us, joy lies right at the center. Where, though, is the joy in the mathematically constructed pseudo-world of abstract explanation? Well, you really can't find it. So this will conclude our discussion of this book. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to more videos.